again, we can immediately identify our title. As I said, we always jot down what are the connotations associated with the title. The Lake Isle of Inish Free, we're talking about very specific place in Sligo. <clears throat> Yates here, hugely idealistic poem, thinking about, you know, how things could be and how I want to return to nature and just have a, little, have a simplistic life. It's way OTT, it's way over the top, and therefore it becomes just a simple poem about fantasy and about escapism and idealistic and, and idealism as opposed to actually action, all right? It's, this is uh, the example I always give when I'm going through this poem is that you know, you're, you've had a big one on Saturday night and then you're lying on the couch on Sunday and your mum says to you, listen, we've, we've guests coming over for Sunday dinner. I need you to get up and I need you to hoover the sitting room floor. And you're like, yeah, mum, I'll do it right now. 20 minutes later, yeah, mum, I'll do it now. 20 minutes later, yeah, mum, I'll do it now. Like we both know that that floor is gonna be hoovered, but it's not gonna be hoovered by you. So the constant repetition of, yeah, I'll do it now, I'll do it now, I'll do it now, only serves to highlight the fact that that's, that thing is not going to happen. In the same way here, I will arise and go now. I will arise and go now. I will arise and go now. Yates is not going anywhere, all right? So it is pure idealistic, pure escapism, pure fantasy, okay? Lake Isle of Inchfree, as I said, in Sligo, this is very much a poem of contrast. So as I'm going through these, I'm saying these things, guys, we're jotting down the little statements. Very much a poem of contrast. Content and structure-wise, uh, very, very um, conventional. All right, very, very linear, okay? I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free as we have our modal verb there of go, go, go. I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free. And a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. You guys remember your junior cert history, the, the wattle and daub houses. This is like rustic, proper, like just gonna live kind of almost... Um, Lenny and George-esque, you know, live off the fat of the land. That's a nice little quote I tell my students to use. If you've ever done Of Mice and Men by Steinbeck, you know, live off the fat of the land. This is kind of the idea uh, that, that Yeats is presenting within this poem here. So, a wattle and daub's clay and wattle's made. Nine bean rows will I have there. A hive for the honey bee. So, gustatory information. That's not all, uh, often that, I suppose, gustatory information uh, comes up in terms of our sensory language, but gustatory with the bean rose, the, the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade, and yet more sensuous language there in terms of our aural quality. So the wattle and daub house, visual, the uh, beans and honey is gustatory, and then again, the noise of the bees as well is aural. So it's very, very sensuous, uh, very kind of, uh, uh, I suppose, detailed, descriptive opening stanza. Yeats clearly want on, uh, wanting us as readers to visualise the setting, the exposition, as we spoke about before. So a huge amount of stylistic elements going on at the beginning of this poem, okay? Second stanza, note the use of and at the beginning of sentences, and this, and this, and this. Again, we would have looked at Kennelly, and when we're looking at kind of a... Uh, you know, uh, when you're trying to progress you, your statements, you're using enjambment, you're starting sentences with and because it gives a pace and speed. So here, Yates starting with an and, again, suggests a want, suggests a necessity to get out of where he is currently, which is London, to get out of there and return back to Inish Free. Okay? And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow. We're starting to see a stylistic trait now of the repetition being used. Okay, vocab choice being used there. Lineation, we might even describe it as some peace for peace comes dropping slow. Dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. So we've got our contrast between morning and evening. The midnight's all a glimmer and noon a purple glow. That line there really adds into the whimsy, the magical sense of this place that Yeats is creating, that there is something almost otherworldly about uh, Inish Free. You know, the color purple, for example, is very magical. The idea of midnight's all a glimmer, the language being used there, glimmer with their internal, I suppose, alliteration being used there as well, uh, midnight and glimmer. 
repetition of the M and noon a purple glow. So and even the essence of noon and glow there as well, that noise, it's just that natural kind of flow that creates that magic and whimsy to the line. An evening full of the linnet's wings. And there's an interesting kind of like end of first stanza, end of second stanza. We get be loud glade and then we get linnet's wings. And it's just this naturalistic noise, just this like, I suppose, the noise of nature. The bees, the linnet's wings. Again, it's all very, very peaceful, okay? Um, third and final stanza. I will arise and go now. There's our lineation. Again, we remind ourselves about that term. You could describe it as anaphora as well. H4, h 5 will describe it as pure repetition. You, on the other hand, now have the ability to describe it as lineation or indeed anaphora. I will arise and go now for always night and day. So there's always the constant thought about this place. I hear lake water lapping, so the assonance there. Guys, there's two types of onomatopoeia. Uh, again, I've told you this before. Uh, again, no harm just to remind ourselves. Onomatopoeia, when the word sounds like the action. So lapping there, for example, lake water lapping with the repetition of A. There is two types of um, onomatopoeia euphony and cacophony. Uh, euphony is our soft noises and cacophony is our harsh noises. Here I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. The uh, assonance of the A and then indeed of the O is euphonous onomatopoeia. Okay so again how do I differentiate my paper from everyone else? out of the 60,000 plus individuals sitting the leaving cert, well, you bring in terminology, you bring in little statements like that that other individuals aren't using, okay? Euphonous onomatopoeia, okay? I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray, look at the contrast. The contrast between the magic, the whimsy, the color, the noise of Inish Free versus while I stand on the roadway, roadway is very much in there on purpose to get us thinking about what are the connotations. You think traffic, you think noise, you think man-made noise, you think busyness. You also think about London, it's cramped, it's rude. We get all of that there. Or on the pavement's grey, the colour that he picks, again, no mistake, grey, unimaginative, no magic, just, uh, again, concrete jungle, okay, or on the pavement's grey. I hear it in the deep heart's core. Now I hear it in the deep heart's core. When you hear something or when anything comes directly from the heart, again, it's a part of you. Again, you really mean it. Again, it's, it's much, much stronger than simply just hearing a normal noise. So here it's coming from the heart. Those final two lines, as I said to you before, multiple times, last two to four lines of our poetry tends to be the most significant. Those last two lines there, the contrast with London and just the awfulness of London, which is where Yeats was living and working at the time, versus the idealistic idea of returning back to Inish Free and creating this kind of like rustic living, living off the fat of the land, as I said before, in his house of Wattle and Dob. All right. So thematically speaking, again, thematically speaking, tonally speaking, techniques wise, we have covered a lot of the three T's or all of the three T's there. But on 168, we have a little look at a couple of little one liners. The idealistic view of the natural world and the disillusionment with his urban surroundings. So again, rural Sligo versus London. The contrast between the imagery of the peaceful countryside and the city. Yeats' desire to escape and his yearning for a new kind of life, the theme of escapism, the theme of idealism, okay? Note again his use of sound imagery, so his aural imagery and his visual imagery to describe the aisle. Lyrical quality of the poem is incredibly notable, okay? The mixture of sound effects, onomatopoeia, euphony, rhythm, rhyme, assonance, alliteration, Okay, the tone of peace and tranquility for much of the poem, if we are going to stick to that three T's principle, you're going to note the tone of the peace and tranquility versus then the idea of 
uh, just the horribleness of the London, the noise of the traffic, the grey pavements, etc., etc. Okay, interesting metaphors used, and repetition is another notable feature on page one six nine. What I would say is, you guys uh, should fill in those point. Uh, I suppose those boxes when you get a chance. Maybe not now. Maybe now, if you want, depending on how much time you're spending on these sessions, that you pause. You pause for two or three minutes, you try and jot down you know, your eight to 10 reference points and they become then the eight to 10 reference points that you just remember and you just stick to them going forward, okay? As it stands now, if we're okay with all the three T's there, theme, tone, and technique, if not, rewind the video, have a little listen again, try and kind of just cement uh, our understanding of it. We're gonna jump to page 164 and we're gonna have a little look at the wild swans at cool. So yet again, very similar to the Lake Isle of Inish Free, uh, yet again, another naturalistic poem. Huge amount of nature being used by Yeats in order to put across the points that he's trying to make, okay? So he's using uh, so a nice little one-liner um, by who's it? Robert Frost. Robert Frost used to say that he would use nature as a solution, all right? And what that means effectively is you're using nature to explain what it is that you're trying to put across. Robert Frost, using nature as a solution. It's a nice little quote, again, that you could use as part of a segue, part of a, a, an answer on uh, WB Yeats. Again, as I said, I, I think I've said in one of these videos before, it shows an examiner that kind of holistic appreciation of poetry, that you're not just a robot, you're not just kind of regurgitating everything that you have wrote, learned on the poems, which in reality for a lot of us is exactly what we're doing. As we said, we're becoming experts in the exam, not experts in poetry, but nonetheless, uh, that kind of holistic appreciation goes a very long way.